Well, like about beer, so yeah, we're ready. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, yeah. Uh, Singer, I, I don't think I told. Are you okay with this being recorded? Like this yeah, recorded? I'm okay. With it. You yeah, just yeah. tell me when to start sharing. Okay. And if I mean, there's you any can start, rules, you can yeah, you can start you sharing. Can share any time. There, there are no rules whatsoever. <laughs> we will gangster. We might want to adjust audio once he gets talking. But we can just do that live. Do it live. Yeah. All right, we can see your screen. We're uh, we're ready. And Tim, you want to throw them in one more time? You want to F11 them up? Not really. It is. So this is the BAMF of Guy Point Security talking about... God, it's such a... Okay. <laughs> you asked for no rules, so... I put a strike through. It's, it's H... Sorry, -M -M sorry. It, 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 yeah. <laughs> I looked that up, and I was like... <laughs> I had to look that up. That's why I like, I like BAMF better. Okay. Um, uh, talking about... I already... Splunk seams and big data. Wait, there was a, a excuse me, a strike through in your CFP? No, no, this is this is me and a singer thing. Oh, no. oh, okay, I was worried like maybe our form didn't capture that and we missed <laughs> what you wanted to say. So, all right, never mind. I'm thrilled that we might have misrepresented what you wanted to say. <laughs> Good. So, Mr. Singer, it's all the bridge is yours. All right, great. Uh, Welcome to Splunk Sims and Big Data. Uh, this this graphic here was actually made by a buddy of mine. Um, is he's a graphic artist and he's like, hey, you need something for your slides, so I did that. But this is me in in PowerPoint, and it's not as not as glorious. Um, so our agenda for this evening, we're going to talk a little bit about who am I, uh, some introductory notes because I think introductions and foundational information is critical to understanding where how we got to where we're at today. So we'll talk about that history and background of logging. Uh, I find the history of logging to be quite interesting. Um, and I could also hear myself from the silly group in Columbia. So uh, next we'll talk a little bit in about the needs for Sims. Um, there is a need. There's also sometimes a want, and there's also sometimes a I don't care. Uh, we'll talk about the concepts of big data because although it was a buzzword a couple of years ago, uh, it, it still is kind of actually a little bit misunderstood about how we should properly handle all of the data within our organizations um, or in our uh, petabytes of weird pictures on our hard drives on our computers. And then uh, I'll actually get into Splunk itself uh, because Splunk is actually something I happen to, to have a lot of experience in and, and work with on a daily basis. Um, and it, it, although it is considered a commercial piece of software, it actually is for the most part free for most people um, when it comes to personal use. Uh, we'll talk about the architecture of Splunk so that you can maybe build out a home lab yourself at home and, and get into the basics of, of actually how to use it and understand it. So uh, with that, my who am I? I'm Jonathan Singer, GuidePoint Security. My proper title is Data Analytics Manager, uh, and I uh, worked my way up through a master so far um, in cybersecurity. Uh, I'm a big community person, so I, I mentioned that I have a lot of projects uh, my current projects include uh, OWASP Tampa Chapter, which I'm a co-lead, uh, Besides Orlando Board, um, and the Cigar City Sec uh, co-founder. And I also volunteer at DEF CON as a goon. Uh, some of the things that I have graduated from is I used to help out with the ISSA here in Tampa, the OWASP in Orlando when I was living there. Um, I did found the Hack at UCF uh, Cybersecurity Club the University of Central Florida, which is now uh, 10 years on and has been winning the national championship uh, a lot, I think more than any other university in the country. And uh, I used to mentor through Cyber Patriots. I really need to get back into it. That was fun. So I also have certs, uh, but certs are uh, not a dozen, uh, but I, there's a bunch of them and I have a bunch. So that's cool. Uh, first things first, uh, and by the way, uh, this is a uh, this is an encouraged uh, scream and yell kind of thing. I just don't want to hear the echo because it confuses me like um, like a lost child at the mall. Uh, Splunk, no, it sucks. Yeah, it really yeah. sucks. Uh, sorry, let's just rip the bandaid off. Splunk is not a sim. Uh, done. Great. By default, out of the box, but it is not a sim. So so now that we're done with that, let's let's take a trip back way back in the day of dinosaurs and Cray computers. Um, and, and when I mean way back in the day, I mean, realistically, we're, we're talking about the 80s. And, and 
when we're in the 80s, uh, which, by the way, yes, I did exist in the 80s, um, it, the systems had data, right? Like, I mean, it's not it was necessarily a foreign idea, but their data was isolated on individual hosts. Um, and so if you ever had to do something, you had to physically go to that system. Like this was like an adventure of uh, let's let's go down the, you know, computers were, were not necessarily the size of a room by now. They were smaller systems, but still the, the, the communication amongst them was still very limited. The idea of transmitting larger sets of data was still very limited. And so a computer was very function purpose. And, and when you needed something, you went to that system. And uh, as we continued on and, and, and things got better and we saw the, the advent of, of Unix operating systems and uh, the ability to uh, marginally communicate uh, and, and run a series of, of these beautifully compiled applications, we started to, to see the need for not running around um, from box to box. And so uh, so late in the 80s, uh, and, and I'm talking about you, the younger people online watching this uh, that are, don't understand where computers and the internet came from, um, we still have SendMail, right? And so SendMail was this, this beautifully crafted uh, terminal application to communicate with other computers, uh, not just potentially on their same, I don't know, token ring network, but but like actually out across this this ARPANET, intranet and thing that, that was slowly starting to take off and, and these universities are communicating with each other and it was super cool. And so so Sendmail um, was was really taking traction as far as this communication protocol and USPS is starting to to wave their their fist and, and get out of my yard. And, and SendMail had, had, there was a series of processes, right? An application doesn't just simply like run like magic. It actually has like steps. And so from a developer standpoint, you usually put like debugging flags in uh, to know exactly what step throughout the process you're in and understand where you're at. And so SendMail put together this, this kind of crude idea for what they call the syslog protocol. And the, so the SendMail team's developing this syslog protocol and they say, well, we need to figure out how to get data from our application and understand where it's at. And then furthermore, um, what if we had the ability to move data, uh, and we're just talking about event data here, right? Activity data from one system to another system. And we're gonna do it in, in a standardized fashion. And so they, they start to put together this kind of rough draft in the 80s and they're like, look, this is how we're going to handle the logging for our program because we want to be able to trace back and understand what's going on. And furthermore, we're going to help shift our data around because we're really just tired of jumping from computer to computer. We, we want to be able to do it, you know, and, and, and over there at the log server. And other developers in these early Unix days are like, hey, we really like what you're doing with, with your send log or send mail logging, uh, can we adopt uh, this, this standard, this protocol that you guys are slowly putting together? Uh, and since then, uh, it, it magically becomes this like de facto standard. In fact, it was like this for a very long time. So throughout the duration of the development in the 80s and then all through the 90s, when uh, we're starting to see more and more um, use within the personal computer world and uh, use is growing significantly within uh, businesses. Now, now having a computer is almost feeling standard rather than you know, there's only a handful of people in the building that actually need a computer. Everybody else can use pen and paper or whatever they're doing. And so so all these applications are now adopting this syslog standard and, and SendMail is still continuing to help develop this. And, and it was years and years and years. It wasn't even until 2001 that finally hit an RFP uh, or not an RFP, an RFC. And so if anybody like me uh, loves to read uh, really good documentation while in the restroom, I highly suggest you check out, you know, RFC 3164. It, it's just really solid stuff um, because it laid, this is the first groundwork ever of the concept of moving logging data. And then it was finally standardized in RFC 5424. And so we see here this, this brief snippet of, uh, of this RFC from 2001. And you can still, you know, go online and read this stuff. But there was something really interesting that I, I found when I was, you know, joyfully reading my RFCs 
uh, that everybody I imagine does with if they have a CISSP also. And uh, they, uh, they, they laid the groundwork in beautiful ASCII art for what the transmission uh, architecture should be. And so I want to kind of highlight some things here. And so we have things like a device. Well, a device maybe is that host where the data originates. And then we have a collector. A collector could be where that data ultimately ends up to be pilfered or searched, right? And then we have this introduction of this concept called a relay. Well, a relay could be this intermediary box to help forward data along. And then suddenly we have the, the obscure idea that we could replicate data or uh, make multiple hops across multiple segments of our network, or we could relay data to a uh, separate host, but then potentially recombine them after uh, a relay maybe traverses a secondary uh, loop to give it some kind of high availability or failover. This is the actual architecture that is still used today, 20 some odd years later, when this was published, 40 years later, when this was first thought of. So all I'm trying to say with this slide is that SIMs actually are based off of 40 year old ASCII art. That's, that's, that's basically the culmination of my talk. So now that we understand uh, uh, is, is there any questions from the crowd real quickly? I thought I saw a, a blip of the microphone, but but if not... Um, I'm trying to manage the mic here, but uh, do you use RFC printouts as toilet paper? Uh, no, no, because I use really heavyweight print, uh, paper in my printer. It's very heavy, like like four, like a 40 pound is, 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 is it, it, it's a little bit more does aggressive. It, does it have the dot matrix? stuff on the side that you have to like no i don't have a reel and, and it doesn't it's not connected and i don't tear it um my i, I ran out of of matrix uh, tape so um <laughs> all right so anyways um but i wanted to i wanted to highlight that because because this is this is where logging came from this is this is the advent of the modern sim that we consider today, right? And so, so this this idea now is, has been born of centralized logging, right? These systems they used to we used to have to run around from system to system. We used to do this thing called a crash cart in the data center, right? So, so has anybody ever worked in in a data center with hot and cold aisles? A uh, crash cart uh, was a small cart that had a monitor and a keyboard on it. And uh, you would have to look up the address of where a server was located if there was an error. And you would then go, okay, cabinet 16, uh, U5, like, and then plug in a VGA and a PS2 into the server and be like, all right, let's figure out what's going on. So, so we don't have to do that anymore. All of a sudden, we can collect the logs from each system and bring them to one central location. Like, this is awesome. And we can store them for long term, right? And so you got to remember, hard drives way back in the day were like 800 megabytes. Like, we were never going to fill that up, by the way never going to fill up 800 megabytes. And then like the 1.2 gigabyte hard drive comes out. We're never going to fill that up. Um, right? But that's also like when hard drives were like five and a quarter still too. But uh, but uh, so so data was, was very critical on servers. And if we could build a, a purpose-built storage server and we can shift all that data off, we didn't have to worry about the original host having uh, data issues, right? And it was so much easier um, going uh, to one place instead of collect instead of running around. And and the best part is is we had tools like grep, like we could grep really quickly across all of the data of all those servers, right? And we could identify a user or an IP immediately across our entire environment and and which uh, server this data was coming from. And and so so you know. Uh, it was it was definitely really cool, but it wasn't perfect. We were, we were far from perfect, right? What if we filled up the the hard drive on the syslog server, right? Because again, it, we were still very limited in in the concept of, um, you know, how much space we had. And you know, really, at the end of the day, syslog hasn't changed in much either. It, it's still um, this this UDP based protocol right there's no handshake so that means if if the data is essentially just transmitted we, there's no there's no way to validate that it was received there's possible you know uh data loss and, and packet loss along the way uh, well like especially if you had stuff like network congestion does anybody remember running a 10 base t hub right like you know that's how we ran the data centers it was a 10 base t hub at the top of the rack 3com and it was a bunch of servers and uh you know if there was any issue 
at all, uh, we would potentially lose, you know, UDP data. Um, and so just, you know, understanding how things work was really critical to make sure we could fix problems and we could diagnose things at scale. Um, and so poor configuration leads to poor performance. And uh, the worst thing, in my opinion, in security is not doing anything with the information too. And so if you're storing it all and you're not doing any of it, uh, that you need to make sure that you are actually using the data that is uh, being collected. So what does it look like, right? So we literally would sit there and we say, okay, let's let's tail through some logs. Let's let's grab through some logs. Uh, said awk cut. You know, um, I mean, where's where's my where's my you know console cowboys and cowgirls out there? This is this is exactly how we did this. We go through the logs and we look at stuff and we grab things and we we have to reformat it. And, uh, it was it was always really fun. Um, uh, but but then then we we realized that that consoles are boring and we had to build these these classic web apps and so so this this new generation of centralized logging hits the scene and we say okay uh, we're we're using GUIs now and we're we're working in things like Windows and OS two warp and you know you need to get with the times um, yes I. I will admit I am still using grep and awk and said uh, to this day uh, because I sometimes find it to be faster uh, for what I'm trying to do. So yes, I completely agree that in 2022, uh, nothing has changed in 40 years. I'm still sticking with it. Is, it, is this a screenshot that you've held for eight years or is it one that you found on the internet? Uh, this is totally from the internet. So, uh, but anyway, so so we're we're now moving into this idea of of um, uh, turning uh, these legacy applications of, of syslog writing to a file and, and using system tools to to analyze it too, uh, building applications specifically around um, making that data available via GUI, via web, via some kind of app, some kind of graphical interface that is not just a terminal anymore. And so we're, we're, we're moving into this, this modern concept. And so back in the early 2000s, um, we, we invent the SIM. Well, we didn't invent it. I didn't have nothing to do with inventing the SIM. In fact, I was busy hacking server 2003 stuff. Um, for inventing that. Well done. Yeah, yeah. yeah, but you know who did invent it? Uh, uh, some somebody on the internet, uh, but Gardner coined it, right? And and they they're gonna do the claim the king thing, and so it's centralized logging with a security twist, right? It, it's this sim, this idea of of let's just not take all of your data, let's not just you know collect it from all these places, uh, let's let's do stuff with it, let's do some real time analysis with security mindset, with with generating alerts by by applications, and systems, network hardware, right? And so. So this 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 like idea of SIM 1.0 was was invented, and so SIM 1.0 was uh, a stack. Uh, it was basically an upgrade from from the concept of centralized logging with syslog, where we would take all the things, put it in one place, and be able to uh, do that kind of grepping and do that kind of searching, uh, but with the the focus in um, a SIM. Oh yeah. There was a holy war because it was definitely information and event, um, and I didn't even get into that aspect of it because it was at one point SIM and SEM, and then we had to bring those together so that it's SIEM. Um, and so again, the, the good good on you for reading your RFCs. Uh, and so uh, so so we we're, we're we're saying data is great, but security data is, is even better. Um, and so SIM 1.0 was, was kind of built and, and sometimes companies built their own tools. There was very few businesses on the market at the time. And then um, it started to grow from there. And then eventually we saw the advent of SIM 2.0. SIM 2.0 was the uh, expansion to use outside data to influence our internal data. So stuff like threat feed data. How can I take a list of known bad IP addresses, correlate that against my known internal data and say this is bad, right? The original SIM 1.0 was like, if we see root, like, tell me, right? Like that, that was the idea was like, root and administrator was bad, I need to know when. Now it's, is, is some, is root or administrator and dot ru or root and administrator and IP address, right? And so, so this, this idea of, of now merging inside company data that is used for security purpose with this outside influence of data to help really enhance that. And we've we've kind of moved on to SIM 3.0 these days. So 
more recently sim 3.0 is this growth in the direction of um of uba or ueba for some people right user behavioral analytics and uh and the adoption of soar right and back again and say it with me uh, back in my day we used to call it pearl scripts uh because that's all it really is <laughs> i'm sorry but soar <laughs> No, so, I mean, so it's just scripts. I that, that's so that's something new because I hadn't even heard of like to, to me. I feel like a lot of people are still stuck at 1.0, right? Because they're not even taking in that threat. Because you got this whole other field now with threat intelligence, correct? And now you're supposed to take that and fit it in for SOAR. And then a lot of people want to do the user behavior analytics, but like I, I just feel like there's a lot of people that just are stuck at one could, could, just because they don't have the resources, they don't have the manpower, they don't have the the skill set or the intelligence to really get it's, it's out of it. It's a number of factors that uh, that has caused a lot of businesses to be stuck in a legacy, legacy sim mindset. And they haven't really graduated or matured to be able to support some of these more modern technologies. And they'd be surprised to actually, the modern sim technologies are so turnkey and capable that if they were to just invest a little bit of time and a lot of money, uh, you would actually step your security game up uh, and maturity up multiple folds uh, as far, yeah. but the level the, of effort. The problem there is really a low. lot of money to invest well, into something. <laughs> I said that very nonchalantly as if I cut I checks. <laughs> well, I was going to say the stocks that I'm involved in kind of like they want to get to all those places, but they're still trying to even just figure out 1.0 just in general, like yeah. 1.0. And even would you say even just auto, getting to automation is kind of like 2.0? Like automa no. automating some of the dumb stuff out, right? Well, technically, automation is still uh, classified as a 3.0 initiative, um, but but you can jump. But the, the whole problem, is that, well, it's a twofold. One, you have to know what you want to automate. So what is it you do every single day repetitively? Um, the other one is, do you have uh, the data that's capable of determining right. uh, response of outcome? And and we can get into that later on um, because that's, that's some fun stuff. Uh, but but realistically, what do we expect out of a modern day sim, right? We want to be able to search. We want to be able to report because business. Uh, we want to do dashboards and pretty graphs. So we want to do correlations across multiple data sources, right? So now I'm not just saying, what can Syslog show me? And so beyond that, I want to see I want to see a firewall correlated with a server event log correlated with a VPN. Um, retention and cycling, right? So I need to, PCI says I need to keep them and, and or I need to purge them on a regular basis because because also PCI says you can't keep data. But anyways, uh, it, alerts and, and, and notifications. How am I getting the message out? And device monitoring is this hot new thing, right? The concept of, of telemetry, open telemetry, right? Well, and, and, and all these great things. Um, and again, back in mind, we should just call it Nagios. Um, so are and, you, so you're, you've talked a lot about Syslog. You kind of didn't uh, move into any other format of logging file. What do you see as the main uh, format for sending log data these days? Because so, you know, if we're in Sim two and three at this point, and you're still sending syslog, that's kind of a uh, you can't get issues. away from it. So, so like even the most modern appliances from Cisco and Palo Alto are still using syslog protocol um, in port five one four UDP. <laughs> so, so unencrypted. well, yeah, but I've I've also seen the the side of what you have to do to try and uh, merge UDP messages from a uh, firewall that is more than the UDP packet. <laughs> so again, it's it's on a per source basis. It gets really interesting um, when you have to say, okay, well, I have a bunch of Windows servers, so they're Windows event logs, so we have to figure out how to do that. And we have a bunch of Linux servers, and they're, they write to the var log folder, so we got to figure out how to do that. And then you have all these silly appliances, mostly virtual these days. We got to figure out how to do that. And then the rest of it really is just API driven. So it's cloud to cloud. Uh, it's, it's, I pick the API, and then you give me the latest 400 events and it comes over. And so most m events these days. So there's there's the transmission protocol that we that has to be con determined and figured out and architected. And then there's the actual like layer seven payload protocol that still has to be determined and architected. So like data still comes in sometimes as raw strings. Sometimes it comes as key value pair. Sometimes it comes in as JSON or XML. I would love it if it's structured. Right? Um, it, it's, it's, there's still no perfect standard. So everything is still one-off. At the end of the day, like it's it's 
it, it's always going to be a nightmare because everybody thinks they're going to do it better than everybody else. Um, and so, and what is that? That's the XKCD that says uh, we have 972 uh, logging or uh, uh, data protocols, and uh, yeah. then we're going to come up with a new one. And so now we have that plus one. Exactly. And oh, did I mention compliance? Right. Yeah. Because uh, compliance is cool. Um, and so, so compliance is, I think, you know, I think one of the biggest drivers behind why you do any of this stuff in the first place. I mean, obviously good hygiene, cyber hygiene is important, but, but compliance is a help. It helps a lot because it's a need, not a want, uh, and needs get budgets. And so compliance told you so, right? You have SOX audits for publicly traded companies, FISMA, PCI, HIPAA, and BERPA, and ISO 27001. And sometimes they say stuff about it. Sometimes they don't, but we can use compliance as an excuse. Um, Sometimes you just want to run a sock, right? Yeah, I want to, I want to be a, a soundboard of you just dramatically reading out standards and security. Yeah, levels. yeah, all day, all day long. <laughs> yeah. I mean, well, you can just go pull it off your table. I, I have, I have acoustic paneling in my bathroom too. So, uh, so the other thing is too, like this concept of single pane of glass, right? Uh, we, we have a lot of security tools today uh, and again, buzzwords, but the reality is, is if you're jumping from console to console application to application, you're wasting time. Why not put it all in one location and again, correlate against it. Um, and I also, I just like to hope that people care about security. It's, it's me being optimistic. Uh, so, so software and cheap, right? You want to do this, you have, you want to build a sock, right? And so you can do the free way, right? You got elk stack, you got, this log 40 years later um kiwi right? oh windows kiwi uh and and did i mention splunk is actually free up to a certain point so build a lab why not um but none of these are actually really sims these are just centralized logging platforms well okay fine then then what is a sim well sim and from a commercial perspective we got devo and exabeam and logger them sumo logic and qradar and splunk enterprise security and many more and by no means am i endorsing any of these i'm just saying that they cost money and they they the ones on the left all uh, but does not call them a sim or is it like would you put any of them in like the 1.0 2.0 well, well no no so the commercial stuff those are sims commercial those are sims the free stuff is not a sim you you before from like the you know the free integration that usually is, is I feel like it's a cop out um, like like the Spl Splunk side or like Tenable has a log ag aggregator that will read this log but um, they they all do I mean al almost everybody today has the XDR right and X uh, I'll uh, I explore uh, you to tell me what the X and XDR means uh, so you know and and don't don't say extended. Extra, extra, extra detection response. Extra detection response. There you go. It, because because in this in this case X is a variable. Um, it, it, it is. It, it, it's solved for X. X. X can equal E. Yeah. X can equal N. Right. Uh, X can equal a number of different things. Uh, but that's the world we're living in. But but no. no so I, I, I do want to I do want to like tag on what they have like Elk Stack. You kind of see that as the that's almost the free version, right? It's a pain. There's a but, lot of there's but a lot it's of not a sim because you pay for elk security, elastic security. If you just want a data aggregator, it's open source and free. So, but there are also other things uh, like um, Security Onion, NSM, there are uh, Rock, NSM. You know, there are some others that are doing more with that that are on the free side uh, with a commercial side. So you kind of have Splunk free and then Splunk. Yeah, enterprise. Yeah, so they do. you know, they're Elk free, Elk enterprise, Splunk free, Splunk enterprise. But a lot of like the commercial products and a lot of other things use these free components, right? So I, it's yes. a little disingenuous <laughs> to say that they're not something when it's an integral part of something. And if you're saying that there's something more to these commercial products, um, there are potentially something more to some of the free products. You just might not be listing them there. So a, a elk stack can be a sim. It's just not a sim out of the box. Uh, Splunk free can be a sim. It's just not a sim out of the box. Commercial software is a sim out of the box. 
that's the big difference is that they come with a content library of security correlations. And that's the gap from centralized logging to set is as data graduated to security. So, so are you saying you have to put the work in to actually get to that sim point? Yeah. Yeah. You're just not collect. Okay. I see what you're saying. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. And so, so, so commercial is turnkey free is, is, is work. There's still a cost. There's either you're working at it. Even it it's, it's an free. opportunity cost or, or an, an, a, a capex cost. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I see what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yep. No, I agree because I've seen, there was a sock and you can go look at my LinkedIn profile. There was a sock that we worked at and we spent a ton of money on an enterprise solution, but we did not use any of the automation or the turnkey stuff that you really should to like make it a sim so it was essentially and i know this because i had to go through all the logs manually yeah so 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 what you're saying yeah. is that's not a sim that's a log aggregate log co collector that people analysts are having to go through versus like actually putting in the work to make it some sort of sim. Yeah. like if 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 elk has the potential of being a sim, then my one liners and bash have the potential of being a sim. So oh, and they do. Um, <laughs> I, I'm just saying that um, I've worked with Q radar and uh, a few of the other commercial sims and you still have to uh, we've actually been turned away from log sources. And then you have to write your own parser because we're just not going to do that. Yeah. And right. So I'm I understand you're saying that, you know, free isn't cheap or free is free, but you have to put in time, but you can also pay a lot of money to a company and they won't support the log sources that you have. Oh, absolutely. And they won't do any of the integration. So just saying commercial is a SIM and something that's free doesn't, I think that's actually kind of a disingenuous uh, statement because uh, they go back and forth and the commercial use the free sides and a lot of commercial companies actually push back into the communities uh, on the free side to improve that side of the product. So there's definitely a deeper conversation there. Um, and I agree that the, the, what we call the GDI phase or getting data in phase is it, it applies on both sides of, of the story here. Uh, that's something you'll never get away from. Uh, it, it, what you pay for in the commercial aspect is somebody decided what security looks like and put together a library of what security looks like uh, for you to use against your data. Now, the support for what they can bring in, that's just a, a that just has to do a lot with politics. Uh, like there are vendors out there that refuse to bring in competitor vendor data because of politics. There's other problems around constantly changing. Uh, there's a number of reasons why a platform wouldn't bring something in out of the box. Uh, and But none of that really is what you're paying for at the end of the day. What you're paying for is a support line and somebody who decided what security looks like and put it in a book. Yeah. So. Well, I, I, I mean, the title of this is Software Ain't Cheap. And it's where you, do you want to put the cost, right? So I do think in log collection, you can spend time internally uh, using some of the same resources potentially to try and do things. Um, but you can also pay on a commercial side and you'll take what, um, what you as the commercial vendor says is a security item. Uh, I live in academics. And uh, this is always a problem that we see is that our networks don't um, match a corporate network. The things that we do in our environments are not the same as a commercial environment. And so um, the things that are often defined in a pay for product are not applicable. We, the false positives, it, it's a weird dichotomy. There are zero false positives in your commercial product until you put it in my environment. And then my environment, they're all false positives because we actually have the things that you say we shouldn't have. And Jeff, the number of times over the course of 
the life of Colasec that you brought in. Yeah, no, that doesn't work on my network. It's, <laughs> I, I felt that in my soul when yeah, you said it's that. Yeah, wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> well, it still doesn't, and I, you know, you know, higher ed is a, a, a unique environment, but uh, you know, we've had so many times where a commercial product has come in with assumptions baked into what they do. And when you ask about them, they're like, yeah, no, we can't do anything about that. And we won't do anything about that, which is fine. That's, you know, we're not your customer, but. I feel like the, it, you should preface basically all of those conversations with 99% of the user base on our network is looking at porn on a regular basis. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, just on a, on a less. <laughs> On a less than that side of things, honestly, one of the things we do have is IPv6 and the number of vendors and companies that just still to this day um, are like, well, we have IPv6 on our uh, management interface, but we don't know what to do or how to parse IPv6 in our uh, monitoring nodes mm -hmm. is amazing. So I, I digress and I apologize for that, but oh, no, I you're mean good. to... You're good. And, and again, you know, I, I also just don't trust anything vendors say. So uh, that's that's the other part of it. Um, but but let's talk about like those needs, right? That that data retention policy, right? What why what is what is a sim and what is centralized logging actually helping to do with this? So let's talk about some of those regulatory, right? Who who's who's a who's a PCI auditor? Ten well, ten point seven specifically says you need to have logs for a year one year and, and three months need to be immediately available. Um, I said 27,001, you know, you need to record all these activities, these exceptions, these faults and, and, and uh, infosec events and need to be kept and reviewed regularly because we all review them regularly, whatever that means. And, uh, and so, so these often help lead to the acquisition of some kind of SIM tool or technology within an organization. Uh, again, I like to think people are interested in security, um, but it, it's easier to hit a budget when you are required to. Um, so, so we're moving away from this this idea of an on-premise sim. I mean, they still exist, but but software as a service is really kind of taken over, even in the sim world. And so, from an on-premise perspective, right, you have you're deployed on your systems, and you're in virtual environments, right? You're you're your vulnerable ESX hosts, and um, and your data centers. And you, you're the one who staffs your admins and DB admins and operating system admins because your deployment team is different from your installation team. And you have to handle your OS and system level configuration um, and, and crazy page files because you're cheap when it comes to RAM. Um, in the cloud, though, right, we, 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 get a, we get the opportunity to, to take things a little bit of a different direction, right? It's hosted somewhere else. And not to say that it's not your problem, but, it, but like if your building burns down, your data's not gone. It's in the cloud. Um, but, but the costs are bundled in. Uh, this is no longer really like an operational expense, more of a, or I mean, it's no longer a capital expense, it's an operational expense. And, and so it's not like a SaaS is like, Rodis and it's one-to-one -one license for on-premise. Like, no, you, you still pay for the AWS bill somewhere in there. Um, and then finally, uh, you know, you're oftentimes this is web access only. It's, it, it's a service. You're getting treated with an application. Um, some of the bright side though is you don't need to have a system admin and OS admin and database admin and all these people. I mean, unless you have them for other things, like they, it's, it's all abstracted from you. Somebody else is dealing with these things and so you can bypass the troubles of having a competent team, because that's also difficult. Uh, and so, so there's there's also the whole aspect of sizing requirements. Data is still is not magically cheap, right? And so when you run on premise, you have to think about like how much storage do I really need, right? So let's say I generate a hundred gigs of data per day, right? Oh well, when you take that into account, really to generate a hundred gigs of data a day, that's only about four hundred servers. And you know we'll, we'll consider some compression factors because there is compression when it comes to the sims, and so it'll take thirty percent off the top. And so we need about seventy gigabytes of disk per day. But our compliance says we need it for a year, so then that really means we need like twenty six terabytes of log data. Now we don't just go out and buy. I mean, we don't have. I don't think we have twenty six terabyte hard drives yet. But we we'll just go buy. Like you can't just store it as is you have to have redundancy 
And so now we need multiple drives um, to, to be able to handle this. And, and we also are migrating, you know, what if we want this to be efficient and quick? Well, then we're not just gonna use spinning platter or SAS anymore. Now we're moving into NVMe. Um, and, 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 and NVMe drives are freaking expensive. I just bought a two terabyte NVMe for myself and it was already $150. So I can imagine enterprise stuff. Yeah. Was that a question? Thousand bucks minimum for enterprise grade. Yeah. And we also need full disk encryption for compliance. Oh yeah, yeah. I for, almost forgot. You you store PHI and PII, and and you have to make sure you have encryption at rest, um, along with your encryption in motion. Yeah, my, my horror flashback. Oh, don't, <laughs> don't forget the legal holes. Sometimes. It, 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 I, I was I was gonna say like you did yeah you did one year earlier I was like at PHI you have to hold for seven years yeah so, so customer contracts that we've agreed to store their data forever forever you mean all the time silly silly man <laughs> so so suddenly the cloud is starting to to feel a little bit more um, yeah, maybe something something I want to invest in. Um, but but then your boss says, well, what do we do with all of our big data? Well, what exactly does big data even mean, right? And and so so breaking it down, right? So we analyzing information from a large data set. Okay, I get that, right? It's a lot of data. It's big. I get it, right? And efficiency and speed is key. Ha ha ha. And and we do. We operate in a land of petabytes today. We we we're you know we did operate in a land of terabytes, and soon we will be operating in a land of exabytes. In fact, uh, Amazon. Uh, has considered the future and is not just offering snowballs, but snowmobiles. So you you too can have a rolling hard drive semi truck pull up to your data center and collect your data. Um, but things to consider, right? We're we're considering velocity, volume, and variety, right? That's that's the keys to big data. Um, but 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 actually, data isn't just like free flowing data. We have data lakes and data warehouses, right? And, and do we even know what those words mean? Again, somebody's been throwing these things around for years. And, and then when you really pin them down, you're just like, hey, wait a minute. What exactly is a data lake? What is exactly is a data warehouse? Well, data lake is undefined, right? It, it is it is, it is this plethora of things. It remains raw until needed. And it's often used by maybe data scientists because it is just this vast sums of information that it's in its organic form. And um, and they we're still finding a place where, when it comes to data lakes, right? Everybody wants to sell you a data lake right now, and they tell you you can dump everything in your data lake. But when's the last time you've checked for contamination in your data lake? You know, I don't have nobody knows these things, right? Still, 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 magical mystery for some. Uh, bless, bless them all. Uh, but a data warehouse actually is a little bit more defined, right? And so, so maybe we will data warehouse all of our security audit data, or our access data, or our you know uh, information uh, around our customer transactions. And so it's processed and it's ready to be queried. And and so, data warehouse is a little bit more aligned with a sim, whereas a data lake is more of like a dumping ground. Um, and it's used by business, right? And, and a lot more maturity when it comes to the concept of a data warehouse. Um, and now we're now we're even getting into this this I don't want to do it right land, which is which is managed sims. Um, and some of you may know these as MSSPs, right? Managed security service providers, properly known in the latest of XDR land is an MDR managed detection and response, right? And we'll talk about that response. Um, and and it's hot, right? It's hot new outsource concept of of your sock, right? Pull up your socks and uh, and and get some help from from somebody outside. Uh, we 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 have problems, right? We we don't have or or we, we no longer have this magical need of internal staff counts because that's that's extremely difficult um, still to this day. Uh, and um, even better, uh, I don't like being up at two o'clock in the morning for no particular reason. If there is a reason, I'll be awake. But if there isn't a reason, I have no interest in being awake. Um, and so you have this this person, these companies that will staff these 24-hour security operation centers um, for you. All right, this this is great, and they could use your platform, and they could host the platform for you. And you clearly have no idea how to validate if they're doing their job. But this is the direction we're going in, and this is this is the land of the tier one outsource and you know your your end of the deal is to fix the things that they tell you are broken um when when there is an incident uh but we're, we're getting there right and and sims are helping through stuff like multi-tenancy 
and cloud uh, adoption to allow these kinds of platforms to grow and, and to really take off. I mean, they're not just hot anymore. Like this is literally it. Um, I would say majority of my customers that uh, are the slightest bit interested in security are considering and or currently using some kind of MDR provider. So uh, enough about that. Uh, let's let's talk about Splunk because I, I do think Splunk is cool, um, and it is something that I'm classically trained in. Um, not piano, not guitar, but but Splunk actually, and uh, they call it the data to everything platform. And so what Splunk is not right. I've called this out early on. It is not a sim. Right? We, we did mention this. Okay. Uh, it is it is not a checkbox for complying. Um, but we can we can make it a checkbox if that's what you're super interested in for some reason, um, and it's not a security tool, right? Splunk is not a security tool, but we have the power to make it so, and uh, and that's important to understand. Uh, just like uh, this PowerPoint, PowerPoint is not really, you know, it, it's a platform. It's 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 a platform to allow us to be creative and build on top of. Um, it is it is almost like Splunk is almost like its own kind of like. IDE, like a development playground uh, of what you can do. Let's let's just let's see, right? And so so Splunk actually is a data analytics engine. It's lots of data from different types, and it's a platform for custom development, right? Yeah, the, you, I want you to make Splunk yours, right? It, it's not it's not as like one off, like one size fits all. Like no, you you can make it comfortable. And you can you cannot just I'm not talking comfortable like adding some CSS. I'm talking like actually make it part of your your operations and make it flow, right? And so it's a tool to grow into a security suite or a sim or, or whatever you decide, right? You can customize it how you see fit. And so Splunk can do all of those things uh, that it's not. I just want to make sure you understand, right? I say it's not a sim because it's not a sim when you install it. It's a sim when you make it a sim. And so it takes some configuration. It's not necessarily always hard. I can show you. You know, I've been like I said, I've been doing this for a long time, so a little bit more of like, eh, I know how to do that. You just click, 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 and you're good to go. Um, and it's not necessarily always time consuming. Um, again, a little bit of training goes a long way. So, like any other platform, it actually just does nothing at first. It, it's like, oh, hey, I'm installed, thanks. Um, but where it shines um, is is the, the platform support, as in what it can do what its potential is. It has a lot of potential energy. It's very little kinetic energy uh, at first. And so vendors galore. Um, and so real quickly, we have Splunk in, in this cloud and we have files and we have apps, right? So apps make data and we can read from files and there, there's more to it, but but that's basically it. That's, that, that's the architecture of Splunk. Take things, put it in Splunk, right? Or at least that's what they want to tell you. But what are these things? These things is is data right and we this we call it machine data in splunk land and uh and so we have structured and unstructured data but let's, let's take a look at this this example here so i have a log and this log came from a, a host and it's got some some strings of data let's see here I, you know what if i were to just look at this log outright maybe i could decipher what it means but there's still some things i'm a little bit confused about right and i don't fully understand every aspect of it. Um, but you know who does? Splunk does. Uh, because Splunk has been taught how to break down what all these fields are. And so, for instance, the first field is a date. Then we have time. Then we have log source, log line, command, bytes, object, offset, department, department group, right? And so giving these fields a variable or a field name is critical to the success of a sim. And so we're, we're, we're maturing from strings to actual key value pairs. And this is kind of the magic of what a modern sim is expected to do today with any data source that you throw at it, whether it has an integration or you have to teach it. You, and, and you know, Jeff, you mentioned, well, what about the custom stuff? Uh, nobody had an adapter for it. This is how you teach your sim what your data should look like. And so, so that's kind of that, that premise around it. And now also all data happens to have some metadata that goes with it, right? So every log that comes in gets what's called a source, right? So the path or the port that it was received on. So where did this data come from specifically? A source type. And this is more of like an arbitrary name assigned to tell it what type of data it is, like Apache combined access, right? And then finally we have host. And a host is the system that it was derived from. Last one, we kind of have time. Underscore time is what it's called. And it's actually extracted from the log 
uh, from that time field. It says, oh, where's the time? Where's the date? But, you know, when did this event happen? Because uh, if anybody's ever been through incident response, uh, time is critical to understand the series of events that took place. And then, um, and then Splunk, you know, not just from the data side, but from an architectural side, does have a series of components that it's made of. So we have stuff like the search head, which is the web searching console. Right? This may be something that some people are familiar with. The idea that you log into this web interface and you can begin uh, your querying of data, similar to some kind of like PHP MyAdmin and using it for MySQL. Um, indexers, right? This is where the data is actually stored, right? And so, and it's not just stored in like flat files or anything of that sort. It actually goes into this proper storage. It's not necessarily a database, but it's a storage system with bloom filters and things of the nature. And then, um, and then we have universal forwarders. That's a fancy word for the agent. And so the agent is installed on a Windows or a Linux or a Mac host. Finally, we have stuff like a heavy forwarder. We saw this earlier on in our um, ASCII art for syslog. That was the relay is an intermediary system to help data bounce from one place to another. And so it's a full system of Splunk that has forwarding capabilities to help data get from a universal forwarder agent onto the indexer, which is the ultimate destination where it needs to be stored. And then finally, there's stuff like the deployment server, which is another fancy word for agent monitoring and management console. So uh, when you really get advanced in Splunk, it gets more interesting because Splunk can be simple in architecture, or can be quite vast and, and kind of spread out. For instance, we have clustering capabilities, right? And so we have stuff like a cluster master, which is how you manage a cluster of indexers, so a cluster of data stores. We have a deployer, which is how you manage a cluster of search head consoles, because what if you exhaust how many connections can be established to a search head or the number of users that can simultaneously be performing searches, which that is technically limited. You have a management console, which is the entire environment health. So if you are distributed and you are clustered, you want to be able to splunk, splunk, right? Which is can you manage and maintain your sim's health as an environment in itself? And then finally, license masters, which is a special type of system that holds that metered license that Splunk happens to use, which is very important in the sense of making sure that your indexers are not violating your EULA in terms of agreement. So you can do simple, right? An all-in-one, a search head and indexers combined. This is great for small environments. When I say small, I do mean like under 80 gigs a day in data. So only maybe a couple hundred servers, you can totally pull this off on a single instance. Um, whereas distributed, you're gonna have multiple servers, but this is great for large data sets. This is great for, I mean, I've seen customers that are generating 40 to 80 terabytes of log data per day, multinationals. Um, but this is the kind of architecture they need. They need large clusters. And so they apply their clustering concepts and they have the ability to have stuff like failover and HA, um, which is also very critical. So what does that distributed environment look like? Well, we start at the bottom, which is our forwarders, right? And we can, we can even load balance there. In fact, load balancing uh, is often needed in Splunk capability. So you can load balance the destination uh, of data. For instance, we see some Linux agents some Solaris agents and some Windows agents. And if one of the indexers is unable to be connected to, we'll just fail over to another one and we'll just queue up our data. And so we have the ability to do load balancing, we have the ability to do failover and HA, um, all native within Splunk in clustered and, and distributed architectures. Uh, then we also have stuff like our firewalls and our routers, that's gonna be a little bit more syslog. And we can also kind of send that along, but we have our forwarding tier. We have our indexing tier, and then we have what's called our search tier, which is essentially that querying node at the top to be able to look into that indexed data. And so this, this, my peoples, is the sim part of the Splunk discussion, which is that one cool trick uh, that, that, uh, that, that security people hate, which is install enterprise security, but it costs money, uh, but it is an add-on module. And it's what adds those security use cases to be able to function and work with the data that you've brought into the platform. And so that, that is how you make Splunk a sim with money. Yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> as, as a matter of fact, um, the company that we uh, asked the question about, uh, do you support IPv6 was Splunk? And they said, well, our management interface supports it. And yeah, that was what they came, that was the enterprise security team that came back and said that. So I, that's why we didn't spend 
extra money for them. <laughs> it could support it. I think they're just really bad at communicating. Oh no, it it absolutely supports it, but yeah. they had no idea what it was, and that was a problem. That's what happens when you talk to salespeople. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh. But no, no, no. So, so this, this, this really is. This is the turnkey part of making Splunk a sim, right? That you can do it the labor way, or you can do it the turnkey way. You can buy your way in. Uh, but it is. It's actually really cool. Um, on top of the fact that Splunk has uh, an app store, right? And so it's 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 not just a website, Splunkbase.com, but it's also built into Splunk in the web interface. And so you can either download the integrations from from Splunk base, or you can do it directly into the directly in the application itself. Uh, it's all kind of tied together. And so um, so Splunk base is a little bit of everything, right? It's it's 2,470 apps and add-ons as of this evening. I went and pulled that data. And these these apps that they call them, they have purposes. They they retrieve data, they parse data, they display data. These are the, the parsers and the integrators. And you say, hey, Splunk, I have Cisco ASA. So I need to go out and get the Cisco ASA app. Um, or Splunk, I have Palo. So I need to go out and get the Palo Alto app. I have AWS, so I need to get the AWS app. And so this, on the back end, teaches Splunk how to bring in the data, if, if need be, maybe API or, or not, and also how to read that data, how to break down those fields that we saw earlier and say, this is an IP, this is a user, this is a host, right? And so this is how it does it behind the scenes. It's not Splunk doesn't know how to do this out of the box. It has a handful of the box, but they're not, they're not as vast. If you if you need a specific vendor, you will most likely find it on Splunk base in the app. Store. So is this is this so is that is that Splunk creating all those add-ons or is that like the vendors? Like I saw Palo and there's a Palo dude. It's a happy that? marriage. So most of the stuff is done in, in cooperation with the vendors in Splunk. Um, other times vendors will actually hire a Splunk developer to make their app. Um, other times it's made by the community, right? And so there may be somebody out there who is like, man, I got this thing and there's no app for it. Uh, but I, you know, I read a couple books once in my life, and and so I'm going to give it a try and make my own app and share it on Splunk Base, and and if it works for me, hopefully it works for other people too. But is that is there a cost associated with all that, or is it no? So Splunk Base is 100% free. There's only a okay. handful of paid apps, um, enterprise security being one of them, um, and then back in the day, uh, app for Microsoft Exchange, um, and then there's one called ITSI which is more of like a, 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 a observability and telemetry platform for system and, and application health. Um, and that's really pretty much it. Uh, there used to be one called for VMware that costs money. I don't think it exists anymore. There's there's literally five or six apps that cost money. The rest is all free. Gotcha. Okay. And those the ones that cost money are made by Splunk. <laughs> of course. So, so apps are broken down into two categories. Um, there's apps and there's add-ons, right? I've been calling them all apps, but let's, let's properly call them apps and add-ons. And so apps are a demonstration of what is capable of the data. It's a set of dashboards that basically says, I see that you're interested in Palo Alto data. This is a, a visual representation of how that data can be used within your organization for, for the better. Uh, whereas add-ons are more of the secret sauce, right? They're, they're what goes on behind the scenes and they handle that collection and the parsing and the extraction phase. They're a little bit more hands-off and they just have to, hand, they, they, they focus on uh, the use and the usability rather than the app side, which is more of the uh, upfront in your face, here's your data. And this is how we suggest as a vendor that you uh, visualize it and utilize it. So. So let me give you my uh, my four tips for success with Splunk, right? And so first one is GDI, getting data in. So we locate the source and we install those vendor add-ons. Step two is we validate and verify. So is the data that you're bringing in correct? And can you perform basic searching on it? Very important. Step three is we build dashboards and reports because we need to customize Splunk to meet the needs of your business. And then finally, deliver success to management because they invested a lot of money and they need to see that it's not shelfware. So keep it up. Um, this path may deviate from time to time, but it's the basic standard when it comes to costs. So who uses Splunk? Really, there's kind of a variety of who uses Splunk. It could be IT users, it could be data analysts, it could be security, it could even be business, because the data set that you're bringing in is all of this variety of different machine data. So there's security, custom applications, network, databases, servers, um, even IoT. Um, and, and APIs and even wire data, so PCAP 
and 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 flow and stuff like that. And so, um, uh, what's what's really actually interesting is uh, companies use Splunk for, for a weird set of things. Um, the U.S. Census uses Splunk to help um, correlate uh, collected census data uh, from across the country. Domino's Pizza uses um, uh, Splunk to monitor the uh, there's number one day of the year. So uh, could anybody guess in the crowd, what is the number one sales day for Domino's Pizza in the calendar year? Monday. No, be more specific. It's a single day out of 365. Oh. Thanksgiving. Okay, Super Bowl. Su oh, yeah. Super Bowl Sunday is the most profitable day for, for majority of pizza delivery companies. And Domino's Pizza is so critical that they don't screw up Super Bowl Sunday that uh, that Splunk is one of the, the tools behind the scenes that helps them monitor and manage uh, application and website uptime and usability. So critic, so I mean, so, 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 so they're using it more than just a security tool, right? They're correct. gaining insights correct. from, from the Dude, if, if you pull out your phone and you bring up the Domino's app and it doesn't work, what's your next thing? You're going to pull up the Pizza Hut or Papa John's app. That is lost revenue right there. They cannot afford that. And so we, we live in a day and age of, of immediate like satisfaction. And so uh, it is critical to make sure that your services are online um, and functioning. Yeah, you obviously haven't been listening. Splunk, Splunk is not a security Splunk. tool. <laughs> very, yeah. Yes, yes, very true. Splunk, Splunk yeah. is not a SIM. It can be a SIM, but it can be a lot of things. Um, and then finally, uh, here's something cool. So, so Carnival Cruise Lines actually uses Splunk to monitor all of the uh, SCADA systems on a cruise ship. So we're talking HVAC, diesel uh, generators, uh, 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 wireless access point uh, crowd locations based off of capacity limits. So they can do like live crowd herding through like events and demonstrations to help uh, make the cruise ship actually safe for, for an emergency. I mean, it's really cool what kind of data you can pilfer from your environments. So, and so interestingly, Mackenzie just walked in the building. <laughs> hey, hey, Mackenzie. Mackenzie oh, works at Drago. He, he works at Drago. So, oh, nice. I'm yeah. super late, but you know, work. It's calls. okay. I like, I like your sweater. <laughs> but you entered the building, and then Skata happened. And then Skata <laughs> happened. Um, because Skata makes data too. Um, even if it speaks Modbus. Uh, so, uh, so searching actually is, is fairly simple when it comes to, uh, to Splunk. It, it actually has its own language called search processing, which are SPL for short. And it's got over about 140 search commands. I mean, you won't use most of them. I only use about a handful on a regular basis. Um, and if you're, if you're at least the, the slightest bit, um, uh, yes, they do, Trigos does have an app. Um, so, no, no, no. If, if you're the slightest bit at all capable with uh, 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 Shell and, and, and SQL, um, you will easily understand and be able to use SPL when performing searches because it is, is right in there with like the, the Boolean aspect of, of SQL and the piping aspect of string manipulation with, with, with Shell uh, or what, what our modern people call it, you know, bash or warning and Shell. Um, and then, uh, and and so this 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 SPL language allows you to filter and modify, and manipulate, enrich, and insert and delete data. It allows you to perform your searches and and, and modify and, and change those strings in that data set to help bring up the data that you're looking for. And then from a dashboarding perspective, you know they have this 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 user interface, right? This is how you visualize the data, right? Remember, we love pie charts because we love PowerPoints and we love management. And so. Um, so it, it contains all these different types of visualizations, charts and columns, but also like really cool stuff like graphs um, that are like chlorophytes and, and geospatial um, and pie charts are the worst. I personally don't like pies um, unless it's raspberry. Anyway, so um, and, uh, and, and so you can you can convert your search data statistically into these visual representations and, and it, it's mostly backed by XML, but actually we're, we're seeing Splunk move into like a JavaScript uh, direction because it can be a lot more granular than panelized. Um, it's very cool stuff out there. 
Um, and then really important, alerting, right? How, how do I know when something bad is happening, right? And so, so it's nothing more than a safe search, which is like a search that's put together that, that gives you the output when a thing happens and we save it and we say, let me know when that thing happens. And so it can be real time or scheduled. Real time is what it sounds like real time, but schedule is more like think like a cron job, like on an interval and, and you actually do it in a cron job fashion. So if you're terrible at cron job, just go to cronjob.guru and look up what, you know, five divided by star space star space star space star really means or star divided by five but you get the point um and uh and so you can you can trigger on user defined events so we can say like if this search result returns more than 10 uh findings then then trigger on that or, or if it returns any findings right you know at all or or if it, if it doesn't return findings i'm expecting results and suddenly it's zero, that means maybe the system's offline. That's bad too, right? And so you can initiate these actions. We can send an email. We can potentially send a text with something like, like pager duty, right? Um, or, or whatever, you know, uh, stuff we use today with, with, with snow and things like that. You can send Slack um, and, or, or you name it, but don't say things. And, uh, and, and we can even trigger SOAR, right? Uh, those automation platforms that we're seeing today in, in, in modern SIM, SIM 3.0. Reports are also really critical, right? Another form of a saved search, but this is more of like a, a report that gives you like a, the output. Uh, Tim, you're about to be kicked out of your own meeting. And, uh, and so so again, we schedule these to run on these regular intervals and, and it performs kind of like uh, an action, right? So I can email your report every Monday on all of the um, the endpoints last week that uh, whose EDR uh, fired off an alert, right? And so you can put statistics into a, into a dashboard, you can put them into a chart, give you some great information about a duration of time. And and this, this is how you impressed your boss, right? Oh, um, so so here's what I like to do. Like this, this is what what is interesting about Splunk and and I I. I I, I call it translating, right? And, and the idea is you tell me what you want in English and I can help you develop that in SPL, in a Splunk language, right? And so we take your idea and we make it as a query. And, you, 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 you. and so when I'm consulting with people, I say, well, tell me a little bit about what's important to you and, and from a security perspective and, and it's more specific to your business. And I'll say, well, I want a graph of, of all of the, uh, the hosts, right? Uh, uh, SQL and KQL. So KQL is totally more of like a Azure Sentinel thing. Um, uh, KQL is more like it's almost like PowerShell um, versus versus SQL, uh, which is more uh, Boolean based statements. Um, and uh, and so, or I want a report of this, or, or alert me when this happens. Right, and you, you communicate that in English, and I can do that that Rosetta Stone translation into SPL. Um, and so, so people say, I want to know when my employees are visiting naughty websites. Uh, daily is the answer. Uh, uh, when a workstation is calling out to a Russian website, that's kind of critical, right? I don't, let's check your DNS resolution and see, you know, dot are you? Um, or how about this? Show me on a graph um, the average shopping cart price for my customer, right today. Or that's not that's not a security case. Or show me the CPU load of my production systems. Again, IT uses. Uh, but we can develop this in Splunk, or or how about uh, am I meeting compliance, right? And well, let's 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 look at those controls and see what we can get from your data, or am I experiencing network bottlenecks, right? And what what is your hardware saying about what's going on in your throughput? And so so translating that's really important. That's really really the it. I, I I showed you a lot about um, about sims and big data, and I showed you a little bit about what I like about Splunk, and I think it's cool. Um, and, and really, I, I don't have much else beyond that. Uh, uh, if anybody has any questions, you also hit me up on Twitter, LinkedIn. I do have a YouTube channel. Uh, it's also under my name. And uh, 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 you know, Mackenzie? Uh, it can be. In, 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 in the multiverse, it can be. I, right. I just appreciate that Mackenzie showed up and immediately started trolling. <laughs> yeah, no, this is good. This is really good. It, it, it's 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 situational awareness and then immediately started firing. <laughs> it's perfect. Uh, but really, no, honestly, that's that's kind of the end of my presentation. I do appreciate everybody uh, kind of sticking around and listening. Sorry, I don't like. I know that it's sort of troll, but it's not. Uh, like I work with customers all the time. And we talk about like network security monitoring, 
and like active and passive monitoring and like security awareness alerting. And uh, the answer that I get a lot is that like we have Splunk. Bullshit. And that to me is like, um, like Splunk is great if you have engineers and analysts that know how to use Splunk to make it great. But because Splunk is just like the black hole of ingestion of information, like your security alerting and awareness out of Splunk might not necessarily be. Um, so here's the caveat to that, right? Yeah, Splunk go back to that up... slide. Sorry, uh, I, I, I showed up literally at the very end. But I was just I saying, Mackenzie, here, Mackenzie, but... you have to go watch a recording. Like you well, just well, missed like 75% of the time. You missed an hour of good data. So listen, no, Mackenzie, <laughs> you, you bring up an interesting point, right? And because there's, a, there's this false idea that Splunk solves things by doing things. And it actually does none of the above. The problem is that you need to have uh, the concept of security tools out oh, sorry, out in the real world to collect those things and then send them to Splunk. So when you say active and passive network identification, that means you have a tool, a security tool that exists, and it is then sending Splunk its findings. And so you have a, a correlator Zeke, bro IDS, right? That's doing active and passive network detection, or you have tenable doing passive network detection right whatever these these whatever it doesn't matter what the tool is the fact that um uh, <laughs> there was a slide that says pay someone else thank you yes uh, and uh you have security tools that aggregate back to splunk and that's the key detail here is splunk is not going to magically go out and get things from places it needs to be sent back to splunk um, and that's the misunderstanding is for, for a business to say, oh, we have Splunk is not the thing. The question should, the, the, you should respond immediately with, well, then what is feeding Splunk? Where does your data come from? What are your sources? What tools are you collecting with? The problem is in the security space, a lot of the tools are things you can bolt on and they start to do, they start to provide value immediately. Like I can bring in a web app firewall, put it in front of my apps, and out of the box, it's gonna do some things. Now, it's gotta have learning mode, and there's a little bit of tuning that goes into it, but the order of magnitude between the amount of tuning required for a web app firewall and the amount of tuning required for a SIM is just two or three orders of magnitude difference. Like, there's so much more that has to go on in the tuning of a SIM and the, the understanding of your network there's so much more data there that it, it's just, there is a, a step change between all of the other security tools you can put and EDR and SIM. Like, well, and can, 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 well, can we just blame salespeople? I feel like that's where we just need to go at this point. Yeah, right? we can blame salespeople. It, 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 look, Tim, I'm not entirely trying to blame you. I'm not a salesperson. I, I work technical. Singer Singer and I work in the same. We're, we're, both, we're both in the same department. I, I plead the fifth. But, but here, here's the thing, right? And so modern security tools are going to tell you that they're going to take your organic data wherever it comes from, and then they're going to determine what's bad. And then the idea is that because you have a, a variety of security tools that exist within your organization, they all centralize back to the SIM. And then the SIM is going to be like, hey, I heard from your NDR that something bad over here. And I heard from your EDR that that host that did that thing on that NDR that made that connection that the NDR saw, that that's a problem. Right. And that's what the what, what the sim is doing nowadays is it's is the volume of data is existing at the security tools. And then the alert and notifications with the meta context is making its way to the sim for the sim to then show you a top-down perspective of all of these different attack vectors that are taking place. And then saying, you know what? These three incidents here are all coming from the same host, or these three incidents here all are using the same authentication credentials. Maybe that identity is compromised, or maybe that host is compromised. And so we're taking this perspective and we're now mapping it back to a thing at the SIM level but the security, the what is bad, is happening at the application level, right? And that's kind of the, where we're seeing. That's why that, that's this whole like XDR thing 
is is fill in the blank for x. x equals n, x equals e, x equals whatever. It's because the tools are feeding the sim and it's this, this marriage of security now happening in multiple places. It's happening at the, at the tool and it's also happening at the sim in conjunction or the old legacy model, which is give everything to the sim and let the sim teach the sim and program the sim what bad looks like. And so vendors today come to the market and they go, you know what? I can save you so much money on your sim license because I'll determine what's bad with your data and then I'll just let your SIM know uh, after the fact. So that all of that extra stuff that didn't add any context, eh, we'll just kind of push it over here. But the problem with that model is that it's not compliance. And we always like to say that compliance is not security. But actually, it goes both ways. Security is not compliance. Because if I were to only care about those incidents that my tool was telling me, I don't have 365 days of logs because I cannot rely on that application to store my audit data for that log. That's my soapbox. So, uh, I mean, you brought up an interesting point there is that uh, all of this is behind the scenes, you have to capture all your log data and you have to store your log data independent of anything else that you ever do. Correct. No matter if it's your elk stack or Splunk or here or there, you have to store that data for your compliance purposes. You could do it in Elk Stack or Splunk. You just have to face the consequences, which is very expensive. And that's the that's the legacy model. And that's what people are pigeonholed into. And they feel like they're stuck there. And we're seeing now an entire advent of technology called pre-processing. And so these are those those relays, those intermediaries between a source and a destination that are saying, you know what, this is security related. Sim, oh, you know what, this is audit related. Cheap storage, S3, I don't know, pure storage, S3 compatible if it's on-prem, whatever. The point is, is we're now saying, let's take our data, let's do the right thing by compliance, but let's decide where it lands so that I'm not paying out the nose for a SIM metered license. The, the, the entire industry has grown out of that concept of how do we make this more cost effective while meeting compliance and security at the same time. I don't like it's it. quite cool. Wild, wild stuff. It is, it is. Again, uh, appreciate you know everybody's time this evening and thank you for for letting me come and, and ravel on things that i'm passionate about and and things that um, that i think are cool and hopefully everybody enjoyed uh, along with it again if you have any questions or want to uh debate me over any of this stuff uh you have my twitter my linkedin um and uh on top of that just wait <laughs> Uh, bring it on. You know what happens when people email me? You get into the marketing thread. and uh, <laughs> You will get spam. <laughs> yeah. Because um, welcome to corporate marketing. Um, but, but really, no. Uh, hopefully, you know, in my opinion, everybody should have some kind of centralized logging. Um, but how you do it, it all depends on your business. You also have to measure your risk. Uh, if you're fine uh, with taking a fine, so be it. Um, I've, I've ran into those conversations too, but, uh, but in my opinion, data's king. Have fun with it. Make some money. Thanks, John. Really appreciate you coming out. Yeah, this is a really good talk. Forward to seeing the talk. Um, uh, and, and actually, I'd love to, to come back again. I have some, some more talks. Uh, I, I have one on, uh, it's called WTF, our NFTs. Uh, uh, but but that talk takes about two hours to give. I have another one on uh, a very timely talk on how to build an Ethereum mining rig. Um, but, but that ship that ship sailed. Uh, is anybody is anybody how, inter- how to buy an Nvidia card? I don't know. I, know, I was gonna say, is anybody card. interested in some uh, thirty sixty Ti's? <laughs> oh yeah, I want a thirty sixty Ti that's in burnt through. Fuck it. <laughs> no, these things actually, this thing works super super well. I just benchmarked it like earlier today, and it is it is like. It's as if I never mined on it for the past year. And my and BMW drives really well, but the transmission's going to go out in the next. Well, <laughs> it's because you drive a BMW, and that's your fault. <laughs> our our, our uh, volunteer Colosac streaming rig 
needs an upgrade. So, if so does my Plex server. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Can we stream everything on a GPU? I mean, how does that work? <laughs> At this point, I'm just trying to figure out how to rate graphics cards and number of miles they've driven. So. <laughs> I, don't think, I don't think graphics cards have on hours like hard drives do. It's got 300 million miles on it. I can t- I can show you the date I bought it. No just, oil change. Everything in between has been twenty four seven. That might actually work out. Like... I can tell you how many hours are on it uh, from well, that. So well, with the, with the new chip, uh, what is it? The chip order? Like we're gonna do the U.S. chips? Like you probably sell those for pretty good right now. Oh yeah, I know. Um, I mean, like I said, I've I've actually have. Let me let me just bring this into frame because now we're talking about it. So I got this one right here. If anybody's interested, <laughs> yeah, this one right here. is that on the stinger? <laughs> Sell a graphics card. How much are these graphics cards? Three hundred shipped. <laughs> Thirty sixty Ti's original non LHR. <laughs> Thirty six. Wait, are those low are mileage? Those, are those low uh, mileage? Not? They they're high them. they're high mileage but in great condition <laughs> it's gotta be better than my uh 960 so <laughs> oh I mean, yeah for 300 dollars, david you might want to actually consider right. upgrading well so i'm unloading some and i'm actually saving a couple to build a, a cracking rig so i was um, gonna say that's that's the next step is just uh it's kind of, it's kind of funny do right, password right. cracking for fun and profit jonathan i disassembled my ethereum mining rig and it was it was all 1080s, and then oh my uh, gosh, 1080s or 1080s? 1080s. Oof. Um, I mean, this was back in the day okay. um, when the 1080 was the new like 1080 like the TI wasn't out yet. Of our Lord 2010. Yeah, back in the year of our <laughs> Lord 2012 or 2013 or uh, that's or... The, that's the year of GTX. We're in the year <laughs> we're in the advent of RTX. Yeah, though. RTX wasn't even invented yet. All right. Yeah. Let's work off with the ray tracing, but I just assembled my Ethereum mining rig and built three uh, identical computers for me and my brothers for Christmas. Nice. So, yeah, <laughs> no, I, I know the feels. There you go, singer. There's your, there's your Christmas. You should just start handing them out at the at the, at the holiday party as Christmas. Uh, hey, you get an RTX. You get an RTX. It's like, like, yeah, dude, John, what, John, what no. am I going to do with this? I have a no. laptop. <laughs> Wait, do, we, do, we, do we have to? I know that would make it even funnier. Just hand them out. Do we have? Ethereum uh, presentation. How do you how do you change an Ethereum mining rig into a password cracking? <laughs> well, so you you don't actually have to do anything because most Ethereum mining rigs, uh, when done the cheap and easy way, ran Windows already, uh, and so you could just install Hashcrack. Uh, Short presentation. <laughs> uh, but like. The, the presentation does go into a little bit of the specifics of Ethereum mining, like how you uh, do proper power management, how you do proper cooling, how you do proper like actual consideration, and the fact that there are motherboards that were built specifically for mining versus consumer grade equipment. Um, and so like there's an entire targeted market of hardware and supporting hardware that goes with mining versus the stuff you buy on Amazon. So it's quite it's actually there's a lot to consider. But again, that didn't age very well as of a couple weeks ago. So, uh, <laughs> anyway. that's not going to stop us from inviting you back. So, no, you can. I mean, you can. You know, just because Ethereum did like a hard fork merge, and and we can't mine it anymore because stakers suck. Um, Ethereum Classic can still be mined, and then there's all the alternatives, which everybody, I guess, jumped on Ravencoin or whatever stupid thing is next. Uh, so they still function as expected. You just can't do the targeted coin of, of the now. So. I think my battery in my mouth is dying, which means it may be time to wrap. Indeed. Oh, I need to go eat dinner. So I'm going right. to say yep. good night to everybody. I'm gonna go good night, John. Find a taco. Uh. <laughs> taco Tuesday. Oh, Taco Tuesday. All right. Bye. All right. Right. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Regretting your choices. <laughs> what? What do you mean? I'm not regretting any decisions. Apparently, the wig is closing as of, um, like, Halloween. Yeah. yeah. Oh, they they Love did they all. finally come out and anna- announce it? Yeah. He yeah. can't even say the word announce. They they guaranteed. Wait! Whoa! Whoa! I thought you were 
New Hampshire. What are you doing here? Hi. <laughs> it, it's no, not on. There's no video. There's no video, just audio. But yeah. She's in New Hampshire. Quote unquote. Yeah. yeah. She's working two jobs. Sounds like a liar to me. I Yeah. We'll have to interrogate that a little more later, but too bad you're not here. Yeah, sorry. Uh, duty called. Fail. Uh, so Mackenzie, I blame got... my coworker's daughter for getting liver failure and me having to cover his work. <laughs> Darn them. Uh, so Mac Mackenzie, I just got a um, delayed quickly. Heaven's yes. door uh, 